We're interviewing top economists and financial experts about the road to recovery for the U.S. economy. Today we're speaking with William Spriggs. He's an economics professor at Howard University and the chief economist to the AFL-CIO. Professor Spriggs, thanks so much for joining us today. So you, you wrote this open letter to your fellow economists urging them to kind of examine the racial biases in their you know, policies and models and theories. Do you think that economists have a lot of work to do in order to have less racism built into the way they, ha they are as a profession? A huge amount of work, a huge amount of work, because we have evolved and we no longer do openly racist characterizations of groups as the founders of the American Economic Association did, but we continue that pattern of assuming that these groups are real, that, that they're naturally occurring. And we ignore the constructs that our, our society has created and the purpose of those constructs are to create inequality. That naivete is, it's painful if you're a black economist to listen to people think of the world in this way. This is a huge step forward that economists have to do because this use of the term unskilled is a pejorative on the part of economists to, to mean someone I can dismiss, someone I can make unemployed. How can we institute policies that will benefit some of those workers who have been hurt the most? So it isn't so blind. It really isn't so blind because we know, we know we are talking, in the case of restaurant workers, we knew we were talking about Hispanic workers because that's the dominant group in that space. That's why the Hispanic employment to population ratio collapsed in April. It had clear inequality implications. Our policy making has to consider the diversity of the workforce, consider the household financial sector as important to the functioning of the economy, and that the economy is a system. And if you have half the workers not making decent living, not having the savings to be resilient, you got a problem for the economy. It's not their problem. It's our problem. What's your outlook for the U.S. economy right now today? It's a pretty gloomy outlook I would have. We're in the middle of two crises. One is a health crisis, which is huge and dominates everything. And the second is we have the forces of a regular recession, and they're both powerful. So if you take the set of workers who are in the industries and occupations, you would identify with they're not operating normally because of the health crises. That's one set of workers. Then you have the other ones in durable manufacturing and shipping and receiving and the sorts of things that are the normal drivers of recessions. Clearing the health crises is necessary for resolving both, but the lingering effects of a recession on the U.S. economy are enormous. We have the least efficient labor market of, I think, any industrialized nation. And so it just takes a long time to put Humpty Dumpty back together, so to speak, once you separate workers from their companies. So what can be done? Does there need to be more federal stimulus in order to help the local and state governments and the workers? Do we need to raise taxes in those municipalities? What's your kind of policy ideal here? So th this really takes massive fiscal response. And thank goodness the Federal Reserve Chair has stepped outside of everything that anyone had ever thought a Fed Chair would ever do. It takes a fiscal response to get around the problems of state and local governments, their inability to affect countercyclical policies. In the past, they were a major stabilizing force during downturns, but during the Great Recession, they became a big drag because of this need to run to austerity quickly. Many have actually criticized some of the Fed's actions for benefiting, you know, Wall Street and wealthy Americans much more than average, you know, people who don't have ownership in stock. We have to look at it from the perspective of what would it really take to re for the economy to recover? 
the less fiscal action, the more the Fed has to do in order to try and make up for that lack of fiscal action. And the result is more inequality. Our over-reliance on a belief that the market will solve it all, just let the Fed do it, is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. I think the big question is, how do you pay for these investments then? Is it more so-called money printing from the federal government? Is it higher taxes? We print money as a result of the way that our banking system operates. When, when we use our reserve banking, banks are able to lend against their reserves, and in essence, they are creating money the moment they make a loan. So, so we let the money supply expand in response to private decision makers, businesses who go to banks to ask for loans, and the banks that agree create an expansion in the money supply. But if you're adding to the money supply in the public space, as we let happen in the private space to create investment or to create economic activity, it's the same thing. So I, I don't think we, we should think of the debt in that way. Um, we, we need to think of the debt. Are you creating money for real economic activity? If you're doing it just to give somebody money, then yeah, you got a problem. What's your view of where unemployment might be towards the end of this year and how long will it take to get back to that, you know, 3% level that we saw earlier in the year in February? When we asked to do social distancing for our safety and an attempt to try and get the health crises under control, it was clearly going to be the case that the moment you reopened that you were going to get some of those workers back. and. That's what we've done. And that's sort of the easy pickings of it. Unfortunately, the, the United States did not do good planning going into this event. Other countries, understanding they were going to have to make very tough decisions, decided this is going to be necessary. It's going to be hard. Everybody stay in place. And they put tons of money into their companies to subsidize payrolls and told everybody, stay in place, keep paying your workers, here's the money, pay your workers, and then when we think it's safe, we'll reopen. The United States goes to the house of the hand of the invisible hand. <laughs> and, and we so believe in this beneficent invisible hand that we just throw people out of jobs and the invisible hand will catch them and then they'll get redistributed. That's our religion. And in this case, it's catastrophic. Um, you've previously been a big advocate of, of raising the minimum wage. Is this something you think should still happen in the current environment, especially given some of the cost pressures that companies are facing? It needs to be in place. I mean, the House legislation that passed to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour had a very important provision in it, and that is that once we got to the right wage, future movements in the minimum wage would be pegged to what's happening to the median wage. So in an economy like this that is totally collapsed and where wage pressures are very weak, it means you wouldn't continue to raise the minimum wage because wages are facing this downward pressure. Precisely as we see today, we have too many workers who made too little money they lose that little bit of money and then we're in economic chaos. If those workers had earned enough money, they would be less vulnerable. They would be far more resilient to these periods of unemployment. They would not be in panic mode. But the best stabilizer is a very healthy working class that can always correct for itself, that can withstand shocks.